So Roger, you're in your late teens, right? You're coming into uh, you're coming into yourself, your identity, right? You're growing up, and you decide to do something pretty darn courageous. You decide to go halfway around the world and have a very unique experience. So, do you want to give us a little bit of context and jump right into your one of your maybe first big courageous decisions?Ure. Um, so I I grew up uh, I grew up in Miami, and I kind of just. I went on a um, an eight week program in Israel, and came back, and it just wasn't the same. Israel was new, it was exciting, it was vibrant and and different. And I, at the time, I I went back to my my mother and said, "Hey, will you sign off on me going to finish high school in Israel?" And uh, she said, "If that's really what you want to do, go ahead." So I actually I went back to Israel. And I got into uh, I got into a program and I ended up, uh, you know, it was supposed to be, you know, go back for another year, finish up high school, come back and you'll just go go on to college and do your thing. But I didn't come back for another 12 years. So, <laughs> so it, it was exciting, in other words. I mean, in other words <laughs> yeah, it, it certainly was. And, you know, it was uh, there was a um, a mentality there that just it was um, it was contagious. And that is a, a real can do attitude, a fearlessness. Um, some people call it bravado, but it was something that I just I attached to and said, wow, I that's I want to be like this. And um, so when I, I finished up high school and, you know, my kind of my choice was do I want to go back to the U.S. and go right into college or do I want to do what my a lot of my friends were doing in Israel, which was going to the army? And so the only thing I really had to do was just put, you know, do, give them a thumbs up and say, I'm interested in, in staying the same course as my Israeli friends and colleagues uh, are doing and just say, yeah, I'll do it. And what I ended up doing is I took Israeli, Israeli citizenship and went right into the army. And the army was a, a phenomenal experience. It was something so completely different than what I think kids in the States go through at, at 18 typically. Oh, there's no question. I mean, we're, we're about to jump right into that the formative and the character building and like that, you know, they, it, it's a pretty, pretty in, in depth program with the IDF. Um, you know, some people I've heard say compare Israel and the United States in mentality in the sense that like get it done. We like winners. You know, is that is is that did you when you go was that similar for you as well? Did you see some similarities between the Israeli mentality and the and the U.S. mentality going over uh, there? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of similarities in the you know the work ethic and the get it done mentality. I think the Israelis, because many of them go through compulsory military service, uh, you're always kind of you're 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 bringing up the people around you as well. I think I think the Israelis do that exceptionally well, and that go, that harkens back to things you have to do even in basic training. You're mashed together with every segment of society, people that you might not associate with otherwise, or, or from a different part of town or a different part of the country. They're you're all sleeping in the same tent, and you're all, you're all getting yelled at by by a platoon leader that's screaming at you to tear the whole tent down and set it up. 20 feet away in 10 minutes. And that, that really takes teamwork. And if you don't get it done, you just go through constant punishment. So a lot of the things that you do, you're grabbing your, your friends, your colleagues, your coworkers, and in that case, you know, the soldiers next to you, and you're getting it done. And I think what ends up happening is that kind of carries over into society where people are, one, they, they develop a fearlessness because in the Israeli army, you're sleep deprived. You're, you just, you, you're, there are things that you get done and you learn it. It's, you become second nature. And then that other piece is you're, you're going with your, you're, you're dragging your colleagues alongside of you. And the expectation is they pull you along when you need it. And I think that was multiple orders of magnitude greater than what I've ever seen in the States. And that's why I think there's so many successful Israeli companies out there from startups to big multinationals now. I think it's super interesting because like, not only did you go through, I mean, it wasn't even, you know, I was about to say you became an adult in about 10 minutes, but you, you kind of, you kind of took on like the, the warrior mentality, right? I mean, it's, it's a, it's a world-class organization. I also like what you said about kind of iron sharpens iron. You, you had to deal with these people. 
So you had to get over your ego. You had to figure out a way to work together. D- did you did you stay in contact with folks in that time? Maybe even some folks. Yeah, in the- you know, there's yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, there 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 are bonds that are forged there, and you stay in touch with people the rest of your life. And, and it's funny, you can ask somebody. Um, they they say what uh, what call up were you, and you you give them the th- the first three digits of your call up of your of your Israeli Army ID. And you can tell exactly kind of what they went through, what they were doing, because if somebody comes up and I say, hey, what are you? And they go on 469. I know when they went into the army and kind of what was going on at that time. So it's a it's an interesting question. Um, certainly. Uh, yeah. And it, 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 it has influenced me for the rest of my life. I stayed in touch with a lot of people that I was in the army with. And it's a common experience. So what was typical in Israel or for another Israeli, you know, eventually, you know how Americans go, hey, so what do you do? <laughs> the Israelis yeah. will typically turn around, oh, so uh, what'd you do in the army? Right. Uh, that says a lot about you, right? It's kind of a, it's kind of like a branding of sorts of, on your character, right? Of who yeah, you they go, what do you, what'd you do in the army? And what, what was your, what's your call-up number? Like the first three digits of your call-up number. I've heard that the IDF also really teaches you, maybe more than most militaries, at, at, at the base level. You know, I hear, I hear in special forces and most militaries is different, but really how to think. They want you to be oh. a, thinking, a thinking army, like, okay, look, this is the order, but you're going to be on the ground. Situations change. Am I on the right track here? With- 100%. That, that's something that I found. I wasn't expecting that in the IDF. And you get through it, and then they're like, oh, by the way, if you have to switch things around when you're in the field, you just do it. And that goes, that's pervasive. That goes from a, you know, a general all the way down to a private. There's an expectation that if you have to, you know, adapt, overcome and improvise, that you do it, that you don't ask permission. And they go through exercises, even in reserve duty. I remember they'll throw like a, you know, kind of a wrench in the plans and say, and and all of a sudden you have to like do something else and they'll do that on purpose. But, um, yeah, there is permission to, to, to change and, and really be resilient and kind of do things according to the reality in the field versus what, you know, what the plan was. Yeah, you adapt on the spot. And there's, there's a lot of latitude for that, right? Uh, you know, like to, to take advantage of the situation. As, it, it sounds like a little bit like the, um, the Prussian model, which was like, know where you're supposed to end up and know your first step in the battle. But after that, everything's going to change. So just make the best decisions to move towards the goal. Is that, is that, does that resonate with you at all? Is that, Absolutely. Is that- and you see, and, and that really is, that carries over into Israeli companies. Yep. And that's why you'll see NICE and Checkpoint and Wix and WhatsApp. And you'll see these, these phenomenal companies that, you know, originally they, they were going this way. They saw an opportunity. They kind of shift gears. And now they're, they're big global organizations or they've been acquired by the likes of Google and others. And that's because they... You know, they could see something, they, they're, they're on a trajectory, but when they need to change, they pivot very quickly and very efficiently. They do. And so, um, you know, in the business world, you've had a very successful career. You're a senior executive doing a lot of transformative work, having exposure to very senior executives. Um, you're a trusted advisor to many. When you run teams, do you, because you've been through that model, is that a model you feel very comfortable in empowering people, you know, with you and underneath you and people that report to you? How much of that do you try to infuse in the environment around you? Um, Wow, that's, you know, I I learned some valuable lessons. When I came back to the States, after a a pretty short period of time, I uh, took on a role and um, it was, you know, hey, Roger, here's your team. It was 12 people. Yeah. And I really, you know, I think there is, in the military, of course, there is a, you know, hey, do this. And everybody was done. You know, and, and, and you get it done. Um, I didn't know that you're, you're not supposed to do it that way <laughs> in a corporation. So in a team, there's a lot more finesse that yeah. has to happen. So, um, you know, I certainly think that um, in transitioning from a place where everybody's wearing the same uniform and there's just an understanding to a much more diverse type of organization. What I had to learn was there's different personalities with different agendas and it takes it back down to it's, there's not this like, you know, hierarchy or this understanding that there's a certain way to perform and there's an expectation. There's a lot more of a dynamic 
interaction interchange between the teams. You've got to act with empathy and with kindness. Um, and I, I, I learned a lot. That was my, my first real job running a team. Um, that was definitely a learning experience. I learned that you have to ask not to tell. Right. 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 I love that. And you probably gave people a voice. And so and I, I love the fact you, you, st- you kept the best and left the rest, right? Like, like, like you still, you're, you're picking up skill sets as you go along. So you come back to the United States, maybe this happened in Israel or when you came back to the United States, but you happen to catch a wave, a pretty big wave pretty early on, yeah. uh, which is also a courageous decision, right? Because it is, it's not a charted course. People aren't sure where it's going. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you caught, what, what re- wave you decided to surf? Yeah. So, um, I went to work for the first DSL provider in New York and I was like, wait a second, people are going to be able to get what kind of bandwidth for how much? And it was almost mind boggling to say, oh, you can get, you know, T1 speeds for $39 a month. I just found that fascinating. And this is around the same time where people were saying, well, you, you know, you don't need that much bandwidth to get full motion video. So you saw streaming applications coming up, very few, but you saw them, you saw them. And it was, oh, people are gonna be able to create and share content, full motion video over the internet at will. And this is gonna be a huge opportunity, a huge business. So um, the startup that I worked for originally was bought by Comdisco. And the team that I worked with there Kind of, you know, we, people were looking for what to do. It was a startup that went from, you know, 20 people to 200 people within less than a year. It was bought and we found ourselves going, are we going to stay with this big company or are we going to go do our own thing? And I raised my hand with me and some colleagues and I said, listen, it's not going to be about providing bandwidth to customers. It's going to be about what you can do over the bandwidth. It's going to be about the, the applications. So we built the first streaming media network that enabled users to create and share full motion video from one to one or one to many anywhere. So like YouTube. Yeah. And it was really similar to YouTube user generated content. Yeah. Uh, We had compliance features and this was in 1999. Wow. So we, that we were really ahead of the curve and, um, some valuable lessons there. The courageous decision at the time was, you know, do I stick with the, the corporate gig or do I go, all right, let me take what little money I have. Let me go convince my friends and family to throw some money in. And believe me, when you're on the hook with friends and family, that's pretty tough because you're, you know, you're, you're burning the candle at both ends and in the middle to make sure that uh, you don't lose their money. So I, I did a friends and family round, raised about $100,000 at the time, and we put together a, a pretty badass platform. We really, it was what you would consider a pretty, pretty robust cloud platform today. And um, we quickly got some accolades. I um, went to uh, NYU Stern Y2K business plan, and I got first runner up and all bets were off. I've, I've got a few big players to throw in a few million dollars. And we built this application. It was very robust. And we were going around and saying, okay, now we're going to take this to the, to the masses. Yeah. So we had, you know, about 50,000 users on the platform. And they were free users, by the way. It was a freemium model. Nobody had done, you know, advertising supported models yet. And so the long and short of it is um, the internet bubble burst. So we had built this fantastic technology and just as we're going out to do a real, a real series a, um, the internet bubble burst. And you know, there was a question of how far is the internet going to go? What's real, what's not real. And, you know, we were saying, I I would still continue to evangelize full motion video streaming media over the internet. It's going to be huge. Trust me guys. (laughs) And, um, and I had, you know, investors that had put in money that could easily write checks and do a whole series A themselves said, you know, we, we're going to sit on the sidelines. We're going to wait and see. And in the meantime, you know, we, we ran out of money and I, I had to. 
I mean, how, how gut wrenching was that? I mean, like you know, I mean, you, you must have been emotionally invested. I would assume, right? I mean, that was one of the hardest experiences of my life. Was it because really? it was? It's not only because I lost money and I yeah. lost friends and family money, yeah. but I knew this was going to be huge. Yeah. And I was saying, trust me, guys, this is going to be a trillion dollar business. And um, what I had to do is I had to fold up shop. I had to, I gave employees kind of three months of runway. I was a, I was a good boss. I gave everybody three months warning that, hey, this isn't looking good. And if we keep on this trajectory, we're running out of money in three months. And so people were able to go find jobs. They were able to do something else. And I did that because I cared for everybody. I had about 28 people on staff at the time. And uh, did that trigger anything in you personally, like some heavy thoughts, down moments? You know, what what was the what was the emotional, spiritual, physical? I don't know what was I'm using it, but what, what was the hangover of, of some? Ooh, I mean, that was just it was you could almost see that, you know, you could see the promised land yeah. it was right there. Yeah. I'm going to be a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> And it's right there. And all I have to do is just get over the next few hills and I'll get there. And, and to get killed on, you know, the third hill in was, was really difficult. Uh, it took me a good four years to recover from that. Really? Uh, I, I, th- I, I was brought back down to earth that, uh, you know, not everything, you're not going to make it. You're not, you're not always, and things are, you know, a lot of things are under your control and a lot of things are out of your control. So with hindsight, I I really had to reflect on the things that were within my control that I didn't do well to not make those mistakes again. And I had to let the things that were beyond my control, just let them go. So, um, yeah, I I was left holding the bag. I mean, believe me, I had signed for a lot of uh, the infrastructure. I signed for it personally. And believe me, yeah, and they I had to pay that down. So not only was it like, sorry, guys, I lost all your money. But now I've had creditors coming after me saying, oh, by the way, you've got to pay us back too. And I, was, I wasn't I was even 30 years old. Yeah. And and you, you know what I did? I paid them back. Hey, I did. Yeah. I didn't declare bankruptcy. Yeah. I said, let's work on it. And I, I basically, I paid those creditors back. So nobody could ever say like, I, I didn't do the right thing. Now, um, as far as what I would have done differently, I think that focus um, is is a key, and you know you can you can pivot for sure, but out of the gate you want to have a a pretty rock solid focus and have some key differentiation, and then it is you know it's speed. You, you have to move you have to move fast enough yeah. because time kills deals, time kills opportunities. It kills momentum. And, I'm sorry. It kills momentum. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that um, we weren't sure whether we were going to be a consumer play, a B2B play, both. Um, we had we had pivoted on branding a couple times. And I think that I lost a good 12 or so months in in limbo with a finite amount of resources. And there was still a burn rate. There were still people on staff, but we weren't sure. And in hindsight, being 2020, I think I should have just put a stake in the ground and said, this is what we're going to do. And this is what we're going to be. And I make, and I want to make a beeline to revenue because that's, that would have been the, the, the game changer. It, it is now we're getting revenue. We've got advertisers that want to do pre video or post video roles, or, you know, just like YouTube, we were thinking about that. Nobody was doing them yet. And that's what the vision was. So it really is about stake in the ground, stay focused, execute that vision and then get to revenue as soon as possible. Yeah. And I didn't do that. you got to place a bet, right? You can't be, cause I've seen that in my own life as well. Like at the times you just have to place it, but you can't be wishy-washy. I'm not saying you were, but I'm saying, okay, look, it's left or right, but you've got to pick one. Right. And then, and just go down and then they start executing and you'll make the pivots. I get what you're saying. Um, with regards to the friends and family that you're taking money from, any shame around that at the time? Was it hard to see them? Was it hard to, to like, what was that like? I'm just gonna it, was, it was brutal. It was, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it yeah. was brutal. I mean, I just, you know, I took money from my brother. I took money from my in-laws. I took money from friends. 
I mean, that was that was just an it was absolutely brutal to go to the family gatherings and stuff because yeah, I always felt like I had to explain or re-explain what happened and that, you know, people got over it over a few years, but I, like I said, it was a good four four or so years before I started, you know, coming out of that rut. That that's how punished I was. You're coming out of the rut and you begin to, you, 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 I, what I love about you is you're such a big dreamer. Like you've got two qualities that I love in a person. You're a big dreamer, but you're incredibly pragmatic, right? Like you can ground a dream and execute a dream too, right? Thank and you. Um, amongst many other wonderful qualities. Um, you, it's been about four years. You're coming out of it. You begin to dream again. What happened then? Were you thinking about going into another startup or did you think about going into corporate America? Which were you at a fork in the road? How did that all like what, right. what come about the next step? So a couple things uh, to keep myself, to keep, you know, revenue coming in. Um, I took some of the skills that I had developed in um, writing my business plans, soliciting investment, you know, packaging up the, a startup. And I did that, you know, for a number of, of, uh, of other startups. So that's how I lived over the, the four years. And I got pretty good at it. Yeah. And, you know, you know, saying, this is how you have to do it. So in my mind, you know, what I was really doing is I was applying some of the knowledge and the mistakes that I had made at Ustream it, my other company, to these startups. And I was saying, you've got to write this. You've got to do this. You have to make a beeline to revenue. You have to not take a bad investor. I mean, I had, I had, you know, I had some bad investors too. The color of the money is the same, but when a bad investor parks him or herself in your office, and acts like they run the show, that's very distracting. And I think, you know, that was a, a big part of what happened at, uh, at my first company. But uh, coming out of the rut, it was, I had to take a deep breath. And that, that rut, you know, I, you don't make good decisions when you're in a rut at all. Yeah. You know, you're, you're really in a, in a position to make a string of bad decisions, which is what I did over the course of four years. We moved away from New York where I lived at the time where I think I was really just culturally and my connections and everything was in New York. And I moved away for four years and it was a mistake. It was four years outside of New York that I could have been building myself back up, but instead I was looking for something else to do. Were, were you I mean, looking for an escape of some sorts? I absolutely was. I was so, you yep. know, I, I was so um, ashamed of the, of, of losing and uh, of this, you know, of that startup going down in a ball of flames, and to add insult to injury, YouTube gets bought for a couple billion dollars, and people were like, "Wow, that was your vision," and I went, "Yeah, it was." And so I looked for something else to do. I invested in another business that didn't completely outside of the industry, failed. I just was in a rut. I ended up going, you know, what am I going to do with my life? And so. Um, I because I, I just this guy and it, did you did you have to forgive yourself? I'm not sure if I'm using the right language here because I'm not you know I'm not sure you had anything to forgive. But maybe the way should I put it? How did you come to peace with yourself? How, how did, uh, yeah, lots of uh, books on tape. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean I ended up saying you know I I don't know if I ever forgave myself i'm not sure that was the right word but, but yeah, yeah i mean i don't i don't i think it was i got a little older i had i was more grounded okay so that was another thing during that startup the tail end of the startup i had my first child yeah. my wife and I, we had our first baby and so i was thinking um i have i have other people that are dependent on me now so it's not so oh woe is me my ego is hurt i failed at this venture and, you know, but now it's, woe is me, my ego's hurt, but I've got a wife and child that are depending on me. And then soon other kids came along and a mortgage and obligations. So I think my, I think, I think that was grounding. And that kind of brought me out of that rut where I said, listen, I can't be, you know, who am I? I, I, I'm not that smart or that successful. I had to bring myself back down and be humble and think I will do whatever it takes to work my way back up to, you know, where I want to be, not just for me, but for my wife and child and ultimately my wife and children. 
that's how I that's how I kind of got grounded and got out of that rut. I love that. I think yeah, I love that. Last question on the on the on the startup that you had. Uh, um, did you see a shift in the sense that? Uh, maybe at some point, a lot of your identity was tied into the startup, and maybe by the end of the four years, your identity would be more diversified. Maybe you're a dad, you're a husband. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A- a- absolutely. And you know, I carried that with me. I carry the kind of the startup mentality, the entrepreneur's hat, because I could see things from that perspective. I could also see myself and a lot of folks that are going to go down a path and make a lot of mistakes. Yes. And when I go and I advise or I'm a mentor to somebody I say, Hey, I've been there. I've done that. I actually, you know, and it's so clear as day to me because it looks like yesterday to me because it just pops up and I go, you know, I've been there before. Here's, here's my experience. I don't say here's what you should do, yeah. but I say, here's my experience. And that is across the board on investors, vendor relationships, uh, technology and business transformations. It's like, you know, I could, it's very clear because, I've been on some massive successes and I've also engaged in some pretty big failures. I, you know, that's the way you form that intuition, right? You need to have that algorithm formed by trying different things since I salute your courage. So you're coming out of it. You're coming out, sounds more whole, very grounded in a healthy place. And then I, did you go into corporate America? Is that the path? So, yeah, I actually, I, I went and I ran the chief information officer forum for a couple of years. And that really was a a phenomenal experience because that brings together. So I'm a, you know, what you might consider a failed technology entrepreneur, right? And I get to go in and my mother was in the events industry. She was uh, one of the senior executives for the Miami, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau for years. And she did conventions. So I've been around that. I'm familiar with the events industry. And um, I, the, the CIO forum was looking for somebody that understood or could at least speak intelligently to CIOs and CTOs and senior IT executives um, and suppliers that, you know, that, that vendors that target those clients to get them to come together for annual forums. And so I joined uh, Richmond and I ended up running the CIO forum for a couple of years. And that just did wonders for that got me back into the conversation with technology executives. And it was a wide swath of technology executives across financial services, media and entertainment, retail. And it was just great exposure to have those conversations. And what ended up happening is one of those CIOs said to me, he's like, you know, we would talk at the forums and he said, you're not an events guy. You're more of a, you know, business technologist. Like, what are you doing here? Party planning. And I, you know, I just said, you know, I told him what had happened. I told him I I founded a technology company and he invited me out to San Francisco to meet with the chairman of the company that he was the CIO for. And uh, they brought me in. It was a phenomenal transition. And that was really, that was my, jump back into technology and the business of technology. What a great story. I just love how sometimes you go through the front door, sometimes you go through a side door, sometimes you go through a back door, right? Like life has a funny way of taking you where you're supposed to go, right? If you open yeah. to it. Yeah, so, absolutely. You have tons of great connections. You've got tons of, you were probably one of the most informed people in tech from a CIO perspective, right? Because Yeah. Oh, what I ended up doing there is I created some, um, some reports. So you, when you have a, you know, a, a room full of, you know, you got a couple hundred CIOs and CTOs from some of the largest and most influential companies in the world. Uh, you know, what's interesting, asking them questions yeah. and, and, and getting them and, and documenting kind of trends across the industry. So I got to innovate at the CIO forum. We created different types of packages. We created um, reports that you might see out today as what you might see from Gartner or Forrester, we had the same audience captive and we were able to say, why don't we come out with reports that will show industry trends across CIOs and CTOs and typically it was financial services heavy, but um, I pressed hard to, you know, to, to really go down the path and leverage that information. And that was the thinking that's the entrepreneur's hat leveraging access to some of the top technology minds in the world and then monetizing that. So 
I love that. So now you've had a number of st very successful stints at Fortune 100 companies. And how do you how do you approach Roger? How do you approach the duality now? Of okay, you still have the startup minds. You still have that like you want to go 180 miles an hour. Not necessarily possible always in a very very big company. But the benefit is you're in a big company that has distribution channels and resources, and and you can have impact maybe a lot quicker. How do you, how do you how do you navigate that world? You know that you, you know that is a, a really uh, that's a tough question. Uh, well, I mean, I certainly learned a hard lesson there. So um, I go to work for a smaller consultancy and I go to do, you know, hard charging, see an opportunity. I want to go down this path and you can see the fear in their eyes going, whoa, 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 whoa we don't do that. Or how are we going to pull that off? And um, there was one deal that I did that was the largest single deal this one firm had ever done. Mm. And it, it put me on the map to just keep going up the up the uh, up the food chain. What I ended up doing is I said, "Here's what we're going to do. Here's how it's going to work, and this is where we're going to land." And it really freaked out some of the the C level executives at this firm. And one of them said, "You're not going to last here." Wow. That's what he said. You're not going to last here. Three months later, that C level, that finance executive, CFO called me up and said, can you come to my office for a second? I want to talk to you. Are you sweating? Huh? Are you sweating a little bit? Were you thinking, I remember the last Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't know what he wanted. Yeah. yeah. So he said, can you come to my office? And I, I came to his office and he got up from his desk, came around and said, I just want to shake your hand. I was wrong about you. I was just looking at the numbers that are coming in. And I just want to let you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I doubted you. It, it, you've done a phenomenal job. That's character. Yeah, and that was just, that was such validation because that was the same guy that said I wasn't going to last. <laughs> that's, no, that's, that's, um, I, I love that. I mean, in some ways, you're kind of like a teacher or an evangelist even, right? You're, you're trying to create safety around explosive growth, very hyperdynamic thinking and innovation. So you are... It's not only about proposing a plan; it's building constituents. Is that correct? You got to build. You got to build a series of constituents. And uh, is that is that correct? Am I on the right path? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's a way to do that. So the, I got away with doing it at that smaller firm. Yeah. You know, smaller boutique consultancy. Okay. Got away with doing it there. My star was bright, and I went to work for one of the big one of the big computer firms. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Global computer firm. I thought, you know, I made it. Look at me. I'm back on the horse, you know? Wow. I got taught some lessons there. I had never been in a firm that large. Okay. And um, I was brought in because of my approach, my startup mentality, my entrepreneur's hat. And um, I remember them asking me in an interview, you know, because my star was bright. I just did this massive deal. And they said, well, what makes you want to work here? And I said, I'm not sure I want to work here. And they were like, oh, hire that guy. <laughs> so it was a kind of a startup-y division within this much larger corporation. Yeah. But, but that quickly, they decided to pull the plug on that within six months of me joining. But my mentality is hard charging. Let's go. We're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. I had never navigated a super political global corporation. Right, right. Okay, so I ended up learning some real valuable lessons there. And that is, I can't do whatever I want, even though the end result may be massive amounts of revenue and all kinds of positive stuff. I have to, I have to take into account that there are ways to, to dance. Yeah. And that finesse, yeah. there's, there's, it, it was another layer of finesse that I wasn't used to. So when you, if you look at my career going from Israel all the way through to IBM and how that, that looks, um, I think what's increased um, exponentially from, from my time coming from Israel and landing at, ultimately at IBM was the degree of finesse uh, that I've had to, to learn to use in the different organizations. I wasn't familiar with how political and how sensitive things can be. Um, and I got, I got taught a lesson at my first big global company. 
And that was also a humbling experience. Humbling. So, yeah, curious, you hum, like in a, you might add any details you can share around that? I'm just curious. Yeah, I, so it was, um, you know, you're, you give up for the large company with distribution and with, with access, um, I think you give up a little bit of flexibility and sometimes a lot of flexibility as far as how you operate because it's, it's didactic. There are hierarchies and methods and things in place because they're large global public entities and that's how they work. So um, when I was going down the path, I was part of a much smaller team in this a much smaller, almost autonomous team in this much larger entity. And when that went away, I went to go and work for a much larger business unit, but I acted the same way mm-hmm. until somebody said, Hey, you know, you can't do that here. You need to work this way or that way or this way or that way. And I said, Oh, then I'll just switch teams. Well, you have to think, when there's rules and there's certain uh, policies in a large organization, that policy was the guy that I said that to the person I said that to has the power to say, no, you can't do that. Or I'm not approving that move. Right. Ding, ding, ding. (laughs) Light bulb goes off. And I'm like, I can't. So um, that was a very valuable lesson. And the alternative and the only alternative after I, you know, let the cat out of the bag that I didn't want to work in this person's organization was, well, there's the door. I went, okay, well, I guess I'll just let myself out then. So when I, you know, fast forward my, my next opportunity and, and by the way, so what ended up happening is I joined a startup. That startup was bought by, by a big public company and we helped integrate and uh, transition to, you know, integrate the, the offerings of the startup into the large company. And that was a phenomenal experience because I, I leveraged, I leveraged both my experience at the large global company of getting marched out the door. So I know now, now I know that I have to be political and and very sensitive to larger public companies, as well as the entrepreneurial experience in having to, and having to work with a team that's transitioning from a startup to a large company. And, and it was educating them too, like, hey guys, no, we can't do it that way. Well. Educating them, yes, you can't do it that way. Everything by the book, you know. You, you, there's a, a lot less flexibility when you've got rules and regs around everything, travel and entertainment, and expense policies and all that stuff. So I'd already had the experience over here, and I was able to foster kind of a team and and you know shepherd them into working for a big company. Um, and that was a phenomenal experience that I was able to move from New York to Austin where I live now. Mm-hmm. And, um, I was packaged out after that transition went through, I was packaged out and I found myself in a very comfortable position being able to make choices again. Mm-hmm. My choice is, can I invest in some startups and work on a startup? Do I go to work for a large company again? Do I do that? And I thought to myself, well, why can't I do both? Mm. And that's been what I've, what I've done. I ended up um, going to IBM. IBM has been a phenomenal experience. There's such bright people there. There are such bright people at IBM. I mean, literally some of the smartest people I've ever worked with. And, uh, but at the same time, um, in Austin, I'm exposed to, you know, a plethora of phenomenal startups with the energy that I remember I had when I first came back from Israel and founded my own company. So now I get the best of both worlds. I get to leverage my experience and the scars on my back for helping startups, as well as navigate the waters within a a large global corporation and take some of that experience to clients that are looking for large scale business transformations that are looking for New, new strategies, cloud adoption, um, mainframe rationalization and optimizations, very complex environments. And I think the biggest thing that I do today that I probably wouldn't do otherwise uh, is I get to look at things across an industry and I get to say, let me tell you what I'm seeing. It's basically telling the truth, telling a CIO or a CTO here's what I'm seeing across the industry. Here are some trends we're seeing. And, you know, 
uh, you may have a, they may have a, an agenda or a, um, a goal or an objective. And if, from my position today, I get to say, that that that's a little flawed. Here's what I'm seeing. Or I understand your goal, your objective, but your timeline to get there or your budget to get there or the way you want to get there is unrealistic. And let me let me present an, an, an alternate to you. Let me let me present an alternative plan or set of plans to you. And I know today how to rope in the right resources, you know, foster a team that can come in and show uh, somebody who is is looking at a very, very complex environment how to go to the next level. Yeah, it's and, like, like systems thinking. I mean, you got great, you know, you can think through an organization, you know, horizontally and vertically, and how do you how do you integrate the different divisions? And it's such an amazing skill set you have. And I love that you get to scratch your entrepreneurial itch a little bit in big corporate America, but also through your investments and so forth. Yeah. But what I, the things I love about your story, Roger, is that you have had the courage to reinvent yourself a number of times. And yeah. You said, okay, this is not working. Okay, then it's me. I have to own this. I have to take responsibility. I can change. I may not be able to change them, but I can change. Is that resonating with you at all? But that type of like... Yeah, oh. absolutely. Um, sometimes I'll reinvent myself because I want to reinvent myself. Other times it's forced on me. Right. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. And yeah, and it's not, you know, listen, it's, I, I am just, I am so, I, I am less averse to change now than I've ever been in my life. Um, today, we have the tools to do everything from learn how to change the spark plugs on your car all the way through to do very sophisticated technical certifications. I just completed one. You know, one of my other COVID projects was I want to start to do more technical certifications so I can talk intelligently across alternatives, cloud alternatives to my clients. So what do I do? It's all, of, not all, but a lot of it is available to us. So it's funny. I use the same, I use the tool that I thought of over 20 years ago that people are, were going to be using. I'm using that tool now. It was in my vision for you stream. It originally was people are going to be sharing content yeah. and they're going to be showing people how to do things that those other people don't know how to do, like build a shed, change spark plugs or stand up a cloud environment. Yeah. What a great story. I mean, I, I just love it. It's so rich and dynamic and so many twists and turns. And I think you got some great chapters left. I, I think your best years are ahead of you. I think you're going to see some crazy, amazing projects come to fruition. Um, it sounds like you're, you're hitting this thing called convergence. I've got a friend, he's a former two-star general, and he talks about this thing called uh, convergence, where all your experiences and all your skill sets and, and all the environmental factors all come together at the right time and creates amazing opportunities. It, it, is, that what you're, is that what you're feeling like you might be right now in your- Yeah, absolutely. I also, you know, talking about courageous decisions, I'll say no when I need to say no. And it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not always a financial decision. Sometimes, I mean, I, if there's no chemistry in something, you know, I, I, I said that to, um, there was um, an executive that said, hey, I really think you should come and, and work with us at this firm. And I said, okay, let me, let me speak to the people I'd be working with. And there was just no chemistry there. Yeah. It, it you know, it, and I just went, Hey, it doesn't matter if it's going to be a trillion dollar compensation. I just, I am not feeling the, the chemistry there. I don't think I'm going to, I'm not going to be successful. And so from my perspective, it's having the courage to say no is even though, cause I know it's not going to work, even though, things look good on paper. My intuition, I rely more on my intuition now than I ever did before. Um, I like working with people I like and trust versus people that, you know, you may have the best solution, but you know, you're not giving me the best vibe. So I get to rely a lot more on that. And those, uh, you know, I'll continue to do that. And I think I'm in a, in a pretty good place in my life. And so I get to do, again, best of both worlds. I add value to the big, you know, the big corporate entity. And I tell the truth to the clients and I love working with them um, and, and doing what I do there. At the same time, I love helping entrepreneurs. I like it, investing and advising. I'm doing that now. And so how I marry the two is I make sure there's no conflicts of interest. So typically, you know, I can't go and work with a firm, a startup that's going to conflict with anything I do 
for you know in corporate America for the for the company or for its clients. So that's you know that's something. So I can't do whatever I want, but I certainly can pick and choose. And I go full disclosure. Are you okay with me making this investment or taking an advisory role or a board seat with this company? Yes, well, yes, we are. No, we're not. And then um, you know so. That's the, that's the only limiting factor is if I want to stay here and add value, which I love doing because I love them both. I typically can't do any, I can't, well, I'm not typically, I can't do anything that is a conflict of interest or perceived conflict of interest. So I have to do a little more, um, if there's a little more process involved in, in, in taking advisory roles and making investments and getting involved in startups, but they get me, they get all the scars on my back, the experience and Everything else, as a matter of fact, I have a meeting, you know, in about an hour with uh, one of the startups that I'm an investor in. 